Hello everyone, in this episode we specifically focus on the timing and duration of fasting or other activities required to achieve a demonstrable increase in autophagy rate. We will discuss the data collected so far and known facts, particularly concerning humans. Our goal is to gain a comprehensive understanding of how our actions influence autophagy, based solely on studies conducted with human subjects. Firstly, what exactly is autophagy? Autophagy is a natural and regulated process in the body that breaks down and recycles unwanted cellular components. This crucial process contributes to maintaining normal cell function. It is important to understand that autophagy is constantly active, continuously recycling defective cellular components. Without this process, cells would not remain functional. As there are often damages or misproductions within the cell, leading to the formation of defective proteins and other potentially harmful components. It can happen, especially with age, that the autophagy rate decreases in relation to the amount of defective proteins and other harmful substances accumulating in the cell. This means that under certain conditions, the level of autophagy decreases and or the formation of defective cellular components increases. Consequently, these cellular components are increasingly inadequately recycled or disposed of. But why is this the case? Why is the level of autophagy not always high enough to dispose of or recycle all damaged cellular components to prevent the accumulation of these potentially harmful substances? These questions are central to our understanding of autophagy and its role in our health. In previous episodes, we have discussed the misconceptions surrounding how long one must fast to achieve a significant increase in autophagy rate. These misconceptions were based on extrapolating results from laboratory tests on mice directly to humans. The mistake was not accounting for the increased metabolism of mice. For more on this, you can revisit the previous episodes. However, today we focus solely on what is known about humans. In fact, autophagy rates have already been measured in humans during fasting. The BreakFast study examined autophagy flux in response to a nutritional intervention, specifically whey protein intake, in healthy participants aged 20 to 50 years. Another study presented an approach to measure autophagy rates under stable conditions, allowing accurate and high temporal resolution quantification of autophagy flux. This approach was used to examine the effects of serum and glutamine deficiency on autophagy rates. Serum refers to the liquid part of the blood that remains after blood clots and contains many important components such as proteins and electrolytes. Glutamine is an amino acid that occurs naturally in our body and plays an important role in regulating gene activity and serves as a universal donor of amino groups in metabolism. Looking at the results of these studies, there is a rapid and temporary increase in the autophagy rate with serum deficiency and a decline over a longer period of time with glutamine deficiency. But what does it mean for fasting specifically? After a certain period of fasting, as the blood serum changes accordingly, Autophagy is increasingly activated in our cells, which brings health benefits. However, this effect is only temporary and diminishes over time. And don't worry, at the end we will talk about another study that looked at the necessary duration of fasting. However, it is also important to note that prolonged deficiency of certain nutrients, such as glutamine, can impair autophagy. Therefore, it is crucial to combine fasting with a balanced diet both before and after fasting. We could probably benefit from autophagy for longer if we have well-filled nutrient reserves in advance. And of course, it would be ideal to maintain a consistently healthy diet throughout your lifespan, regardless of individual fasting phases. Although the rate of autophagy increases in response to various stimuli, including nutrient intake and hunger were measured, more specific data on the autophagy rate during intermittent fasting of, for example, 12, 16, or 18 hours in humans is still the subject of further investigation. However, it is likely that further progress will be made here soon, as autophagy rates have already been measured in humans. In one particular study, for example, B analyzed the microRNA expression levels and the abundance of autophagy-related proteins during fasting. MicroRNA are short, highly conserved, non-coding ribonucleic acids that play a crucial role in gene regulation. They regulate how genes are converted into proteins. Think of genes as a kind of recipe that the body uses to make proteins. This recipe is first converted into RNA, similar to copying a recipe from a cookbook before actually cooking it. The microRNA can then be imagined as little controllers in the kitchen. You review this recipe and decide whether to implement it exactly the same way. 
You can block or change parts of the recipe to affect the final result. In this way, they regulate which proteins are produced and in what quantities. This is particularly important because proteins have many different functions in our cells and their production must be carefully regulated. The microRNA expression values from the mentioned study refer to the amount or level of these microRNA in a cell or tissue at a specific point in time. By measuring these levels, scientists can understand how active certain genes are. In the context of fasting, myRNA expression levels can provide information about the extent to which autophagy is activated. The study of microRNA expression in fasting people suggests that fasting could have health-promoting effects, which is also consistent with other observations and findings. Fasting affects microRNA and modifies the mechanism of cell death known as apoptosis. This could contribute to the prevention and treatment of diseases such as cancer, as cancer cells often prevent programmed cell death apoptosis. Additionally, during fasting, certain muscle fibers known as type 1 fibers were found to contain more autophagosomes than other fiber types known as type 2 fibers. Autophagosomes are small vesicles in the cell that help break down and recycle unwanted or damaged cell components known as autophagy. After eating, autophagy was observed to be rapidly reduced in both fiber types. To explain it more simply, we have two types of muscle fibers in your body, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 fibers are like marathon runners, they work slow and steady and are good for endurance sports. Type 2 fibers, on the other hand, are like sprinters. They work quickly and powerfully, but they also tire more quickly. Now when we fast, these type 1 fibers work harder and break down more unwanted or damaged parts in your cells. But as soon as we start eating, both types of fibers stop working so hard and reduce autophagy, as energy needs no longer have to be met by our own cell components, but rather comfortably by nutrients from food that reach the muscles via the blood. These results highlight that both fasting and food intake can affect autophagy in muscles, leading to changes in our cells depending on whether we eat or fast. Now we finally come to the question of when the autophagy rate increases significantly in humans. According to another study, the rate of autophagy begins to increase after 36 hours of fasting. The study showed moderate effects on autophagy mediators in untrained skeletal muscle. It was found that the combination of fasting and intensive cycling training increased the activation of autophagy in skeletal muscle. In addition, increased autophagy flux was observed after intensive training sessions. And the study almost reiterates that autophagy is influenced by various factors such as fasting, diet, exercise, age, and gender. However, fasting appears to be the strongest physiological stimulus for activating autophagy. Additionally, Blood cell changes related to autophagy have been detected in people after fasting for up to four days. This suggests that autophagy can also be monitored in response to nutrient deficiency. As of today, in 2024, we have already learned a lot about autophagy in humans. Much of this has already been reported in the media, based on everyone, but mainly based on observations of various laboratory animals. As we have already discussed, these results cannot always be directly or only partially transferred to humans. We humans are different from mice, and the difference to laboratory mice is even greater because we also have to take the living conditions into account. For example, people and animals in the wild require greater resilience compared to laboratory animals. As usual, you can find the studies mentioned in today's episode linked in the video description. That's all for today. As always, we wish everyone a long, healthy, and happy life. See you next time.